Dr. Stephanie Cage, and I am currently serving as the interim director for the Lynn and Henry Turley Memphis Center. It's so great to see all of you that came here in person. Hello to everyone on the live stream. Um, it's exciting to be here. This is our final session for the Memphis Country Blues Symposium. So we look forward to today, today's discussion on civil rights history and Memphis music history. Uh, we've got some really great panelists lined up, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, we always like to begin by acknowledging and recognizing that we sit on the historic homeland of the Chickasaw Nation, a nation that is extremely important, and we recognize and honor that history and the continued legacy and ongoing endurance of the people um, who have and do reside here in Memphis, Tennessee. A couple of housekeeping things. Um, we ask that if you are not eating or drinking, please keep your mask on during that time. Um, and the restrooms are located straight back and to the right if anybody needs to use that. Um, I also just wanna take a minute and acknowledge that this semester um, has felt unlike any other. Um, this is a very difficult time for the Rhodes community. We've experienced a lot of trauma in such a short period of time. And so we thank you for your patience and your support as we continue to heal and grow as a community. Um, as many of you are aware, we lost a student um, very tragically this week. And so it's a sad day anytime that we lose someone from this community, but it is especially heartbreaking um, when we lose a young person. And so I wanna take a moment and honor a fellow mu musician, uh, Mr. Andrew Rayner, known, known as Drew to many of us. Um, and Drew was actually a Mike Curb um, fellow. He was the fellow in the Mike Curb Institute for Music. Um, he was also awarded the Clarence Day Scholarship for his academic excellence, both inside and outside of the classroom. Um, he was such an asset to Rhodes and to Memphis, and he will be missed by so many. So at this time, I would just ask if we could please take a moment of silence to honor Drew Rayner. Thank you. I have the distinct honor and privilege to introduce you to today's moderator, Dr. Augusta Palmer, who has been extremely helpful in um, being a thought partner and helping us think about and coordinate um, this entire symposium. Um, she is also the director of the Blue Society, the documentary that we featured on Wednesday night. Um, Dr. Augusta Palmer is the chair for communications arts at St. Francis College in Brooklyn, New York where she teaches film production and media studies. Her work as a scholar and a filmmaker has been featured in national and international film festivals. And her last feature, The Hand of Fatima, debuted at Indy Memphis right here in the city. Um, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Augusta Palmer. Thank you, Stephanie. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank the Lynn and Henry Turley Memphis Center, which Stephanie is so, Stephanie Cage, who just spoke, is so ably uh, leading right now um, for, for the, the great opportunity to come here and talk about uh, Memphis music and civil rights in Memphis today. Uh, so I have the pleasure to introduce an incredible panel. So. I'll just um, introduce them and you guys can come up as I do. So we have joining us for this discussion about the blues festivals and civil rights in Memphis, Dr. Charles McKinney from Rhodes College. He's the chair of Africana Studies and an associate professor of history. He teaches a variety of courses that focus on the African-American experience here in the United States. His areas of interest include civil rights and the exploration of local movements in particular. He's the author of Greater Freedom, 
the evolution of the civil rights struggle in Wilson, North Carolina. And he is also the co-editor of An Unseen Light, Black Struggles for Freedom in Memphis, Tennessee, which is an amazing collection, I think. Um, and so please come on up, Mrs. Dr. McKinney. And also have joining us Ryan Jones, who is a museum ed educator at the National Civil Rights Museum at the Lorraine Motel here in Memphis. His responsibility requires providing uh, the validity of museum interpretation and reviewing scholarly historical content shared by the museum. Uh, Mr. Jones is a native Memphian and attended the University of Tennessee at Martin and the University of Memphis. He has also presented at numerous conferences on topics such as the assassinations of President John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, as well as African-American music and popular culture. Jones is currently writing a dissertation on the racial violence in Mississippi and Alabama, focusing on little known cases that impacted the civil rights legislation passed in the mid 60s. And he recently appeared before members of the US Congress to update them on newly updated evidence regarding the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. So please welcome Ryan Jones to the stage. And also joining us, we have Robert Gordon, Emmy and Grammy award-winning filmmaker and writer. Robert Gordon is the author of six books, including his first book, It Came From Memphis, which was recently reissued in an amazing 25th anniversary edition by Third Man Books. Uh, he has also produced and directed eight feature documentaries. He is focused on the American South, its music, art, and politics to create an insider's portrait of his home. Gordon's work has been shown on PBS's American Masters and Great Performances series, A&E, BBC, Channel 4, and many global networks. So join me in welcoming Robert Gordon to the stage. So I thought one thing we might want to start out with, um, and this is really particularly for Ryan and Charles, and you can talk about how you wanna, you can whisper in each other's ears about who goes first or whatever. Um, but I'd love to hear a kind of overview of civil rights struggles in Memphis in the 60s from your perspective. You know, so many people know about the sanitation strike and the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, although even then I find people maybe only know sort of the surface. So if you could sort of give us an overview of all the things that were happening in Memphis, I know that's a big ask, that's a, that's a mighty book. But the educator, the professional museum educator will guide us along. Well, it's always a pleasure to get to Sponge and watch this guy. He's a, he plays a big role in what we do at the National Civil Rights Museum. And, and as a student of history, he's always been someone I've always looked up to. So it's a privilege to sit next to him. <laughs> here. Um, but, you know, Memphis was an extremely progressive city, uh, specifically after the Supreme Court's decision to integrate the schools in May 1954. And this is primarily brought into fruition after the death of E.H. Boss Crump. And with uh, Boss Crump's passing, there is a significant stride for more black political power in the late 50s. Uh, so attorneys and lawyers such as uh, a young Russell Sugarman, Benjamin Hooks, A.W. Willis, um, and the organizing behind that. Uh, what most people don't know is that there was a, a major convention that takes place at the Mason Temple, the same Mason Temple that Dr. King delivered his mountaintop speech the night before he was assassinated. And a young King appears in Memphis for the first time at the end of July, 1959. Uh, and, and so Memphis was always kind of this area where entertainers would travel throughout the, the old Jim Crow South in the early sixties. Uh, one that speaks, it comes to mind at the moment, being an employee at the National Civil Rights Museum, which was the historic Lorraine Motel, one of my favorite singer-songwriters, Sam Cooke, and a young and unknown Aretha Franklin are there the same weekend that the Freedom Riders are attacked in Alabama, Mother's Day, 1961. 
and Sam was originally scheduled to perform at the nearby Ellis Auditorium, not far from where we are, not, are, are here now. And he decides to not give two separate shows. And so it just goes to show that civil rights, even in the city of Memphis, began to spark. Uh, another thing that, that, that comes during this period is that Memphis is really one of the homes of where the, the idea and the ideology of black power originates. In 1966, James Meredith, uh, who integrated Ole Miss four years earlier, um, is shot outside of Hernando, just south of, of Shelby County. And Dr. King and Floyd McKissick of the Congress of Racial Equality, Stokely Carmichael of Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, they all gather in this room at the Lorraine in June 1966, and they continue this march. And it's, it's later that month, I think, in Greenwood, where he calls out for black power. You know, so Memphis is... Uh, all of these things are what lead up to, of course, when Dr. King comes to Memphis in the spring of 1968 for the sanitation strike and, of course, his eventual untimely assassination. And that kind of sets that, that the assassination when you look at the history of race relations, specifically in Memphis. There's Memphis pre April 4, 1968, and then there's Memphis after 1968. I should have uh, I should have gone first. Um, <laughs> clearly, that was a mistake on my part, a big mistake on my part. Um, always a always a pleasure to share the stage with you, uh, Ryan and Gordon. Always a uh, brother Gordon. Always a pleasure to share the stage with you as well. Um, so I won't add much to uh, much to that because again, I took a hit because I'm going second. But um, the one thing that I, I would add, right, is that Memphis. We have to be careful about the Memphis history in terms of um, looking, we need to have a really broad and wide lens when we look at Memphis history, when we understand um, the, the totality of, of the struggle for freedom in, 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 in Memphis. Um, I've heard people say that in, 19, in the 1960s in Memphis for black folk, it's the best of times and the worst of times, right? To use a well-worn phrase, and I think that's accurate. Why is it the best of times? Because of all of the things that uh, Brother Jones just uh, just gave us, right? We see some significant political advancement. We see um, the integration of public spaces in the early 1960s with relatively low levels of violence. Um, so we see uh, we see mass massive political mobilization on the part of, uh, of, of black communities trying to get um, African Americans elected to office. We see the slow and steady growth of a black middle class. So, and these things should be, you know, these things should be celebrated. These things should be, should be recognized. The other thing that's going on in Memphis is persistent levels of violence being perpetrated against um, union organizers. The other thing that's going on in Memphis is um, a, a persistent investment in um, economic marginalization. Um, the city is expanding. Uh, we're expanding the parameters of the city. The city is growing. One of the primary reasons the city is growing is because the people running the city want to maintain segregated residential patterns. So um, that's why the city is growing. Um, segregation is uh, still being rigidly enforced in, um, in most venues and corners of, of the city, economically, uh, residentially, educationally, um, economic, uh, e economic marginalization. The vast majority of black folks who are here are working class people. And those working class people are making slave wages. And the reason they're making slave wages is because of segregation, right? So, um, so it's really important for us to get a sense of the totality of the black experience here. And also to think really critically about what the, what the experience of a majority of black people are in this city, right? So for every educator, for every dentist, for every doctor, for every teacher or preacher who's African-American, there are a thousand day laborers, right? Men and women laboring across the city in homes, um, in, uh, in, in organizations and in companies uh, in a variety of capacities. And so I think for the purposes of our conversation today, it's really important for us to focus our attention on that contingent of the black community because that's the contingent where, that's where you find the blues musicians. Right, um, you know, none of these brothers are dentists. Right, none of these brothers went to law school. They are like so many of the tens of thousands of other African American migrants into the city. They are migrating from Mississippi and other places 
other places in the south of us to escape uh, the neo-slavery, the, the neo-slave-like economic conditions that are still chaining black men and women and children to the land well into the 1960s, which is slowly dissipating, which is slowly being broken up because of mechanization, right? But the blues people, the blues folk who are making their way into this city have a history and have a context. And the singing that they are doing and the music that they are producing is reflective of a culture that is shaped right, that is profoundly shaped by racial segregation, that is profoundly shaped by Jim Crow. And so for our purposes, I think it's really important for us to, to, to focus and center and remember that fact. When we wanna talk about the music, when we wanna talk about the culture, when we wanna talk about the proximity, right, and the implications of proximity, the implications of bringing black and white folk together in blues festivals, we have to take all of this into account, I think in order for us to have a really clear understanding of what we're seeing in the late 60s and early 70s. I'll just add, um, growing up here in the 60s, and it's an honor to be on stage with both you gents, so looking forward to the exchange. Uh, growing up here in the 60s, um, as a child, this kind of separation of the races was plainly evident. I mean, um, I remember understanding the city bus transportation system as a way to move. You know, it was always, all the buses had black ladies on them and they, um, and they had almost no one else on them. And it was, the whole system was designed and largely is, uh, has remained to a degree to move uh, women from the black neighborhoods to the white neighborhoods to work as housekeepers and domestics and maids and nannies and that kind of thing. Um, and so that you couldn't avoid it, you know, and, and when you talk about when Charles mentions the blues festivals as coming together, I think it, it really kind of raised that image of the buses as a sharp contrast because almost other than the blues festivals, the most common way in the city you saw black and white coming together was uh, to work, you know, for the black to come be subservient in the white home. And so these festivals were a stark contrast. Yeah, um, it, Charles, in the introduction to An Unseen Light, you talk about how Memphis had this kind of appearance of being a relative oasis of peace during the 1960s, but the project of your book is to kind of complicate and, uh, you know, maybe offer some counter narratives to, to that, and I think what goes along with that in some ways is this narrative that you also mentioned in the book of, uh, you know, this idea of racial harmony at a place like Stax and like music overcoming, um, you know, racial division and strife. And that that is a picture that also needs to be complicated. So, I, you know, I think in my film that that's one of the things that I'm working on doing. So I'd love to hear all three of you talk about that, that yeah. relative oasis of peace and that <laughs> transcendent music yeah. that fixes yeah. everything we wish. One of the things I tell my students all the time is we have to question the bar, right? And what do I mean by that? We, we like to say in Memphis, you know, uh, we like to say in Tennessee, well, we're at least we're not Mississippi, <laughs> right? And um, that's a really low bar, right? Um, one of the things we like to say in Memphis in the 1950s and 1960s is we didn't have the high levels of violence that, uh, that we saw in other states. Um, that's a really low bar, right? And so if that is the standard by which you are evaluating um, progress, right, it's really easy to miss the ways in which your conduct, the conduct of the city, the conduct of the people running the city, the conduct of you know, the, 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 the political and economic majority, it's a really easy way to miss the ways in which that conduct is largely indistinguishable from the conduct of Mississippi, the place that we think we are better than, right? So, so it's just really important for us to take, to take the history on its face and look at, you know, look at the data. Look at what black folks are saying about their existence, about their lives in Memphis. Um, you know, there are uh, there's there's all manner of perspectives. And again, when it comes to when it comes to this issue, this idea of proximity, 
and we see this playing out in stacks and muscle shoals and you know we see this playing out all over the place right black folk and white folk have some really different ideas about what sanctuary means and about how it operates right um and it's really important for us to take those different and separate ideas um to heart and it's also really important for us to stop doing the thing that happens in these conversations which is sort of which is basically sort of obscuring and 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 setting aside the the voices of of marginalized people in this case black folk when it comes to talking about and characterizing uh uh these spaces these spaces are really complex and complicated um and i really appreciate uh your film augusta um for including some voices uh in there who understand the and, and try to sort of unpack that level of that level of complication um if you're a white guy who's hanging out in stacks and you're like oh this is great this is wonderful and then once you leave you still get to be a white guy right in memphis um and if you are a black man or a black woman working in stacks and you feel some kind of way about this space and it's you know it's really good and it's really restorative and generative when you leave that space, you leave that space and enter into the world as a black person, right? And subject to all of the rules and regulations that black folk have to navigate in the city. So you've got a different, so it's, so it's, it's entirely feasible for us to understand the extent to which, right, those folks are gonna have a different relationship to that space. And so that, that same dynamic we have to keep in mind in terms of thinking again about, right, the impact of, of interracial spaces, right? What do they do? What purpose do they serve? How do they move us forward? And if they do move us forward, in what in what sorts of ways? So, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with pretty much all of that. Um, and when we, when we use the phrase, it's not, we're not Mississippi, we're Memphis, you know, this area of West Tennessee, this 901 area code was notorious for racial violence going into uh, post pre and post World War II. You know, the, one of the biggest massacres, racial massacres immediately after the Civil War in 1866. Um, the epidemic of, of 1919 and, and yellow fever, it's a, it's a lynching that chases Ida Wells out of the state, out, out of the city. In, in the late 1800s. Um, but I, I think that when we look at interracial um, involvement with specifically with music, when you look at a group like Booker T and the MGs and the fact that they are able to record, have a number one hit in the spring of 1965, um, but then if they go on tour elsewhere in the South, uh, you know, Steve Cropper may not be able to, to, to go where with Booker T. Jones. So I think that those things, that music in a way um, serves as a, it gives the opportunity for reconciliation, but I still think that because of the history of this area, you know, Memphis is known as the north of the Mississippi Delta. There's no question that the Delta was the most racially hostile um, and economically poverty stricken area region in the entire country. Uh, and that still seems today. Um, let's see where to jump in. Uh, kind of going backwards. Uh, yes, it's important to understand Memphis as the capital of the Mississippi Delta largely due to uh, shipping concerns. You know, the cotton was brought here to be graded, sold and traded. And, you know, I remember becoming aware that, oh, of course Beale Street was on the south side of town. You know, so because uh, there was this large number of black people coming from the Delta into Memphis and the white establishment wouldn't want them would want to keep them as, as much distance as possible. And so keeping the, keeping the black enclave on the South side where they're coming, they're coming from the South and the Delta and that all made, you know, dawned on me. I was like, oh yeah, that, of course they did that. Um, let's see, relative, did you use the term relative oasis? 
Yeah. I think that's yes, yes, yeah. relative oasis. So again, it's it's kind of like that comparison to, to Mississippi, as Charles was saying. You yes, know, exactly. If, if there was relatively is. less violence, that's because there was incredibly horrible violence around the country at this time. And 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 so places like like stats were could be a relative oasis. And I, I agree with Charles that you know the important there's all kinds of important differences outside of stacks that are that continue inside stacks but are maybe uh tamped down or subsumed by other endeavors like artistic creation and musical adventures but for you know uh steve cropper rode in his car to stacks and i'm confident that you know the uh many of the other black artists were having to come on a bus, for example, you know, things, everything was different uh, about the city uh, outside of the building and that those differences don't just fade away. Um, I know we're going to come back to stack, so I, I, I don't want to go too far down that path. Well, now. Go, go ahead. I think it's good to go down the stacks path and talk about that more. Um, I, I think too, one of the things that, uh, I read recently that, uh, you know, was sort of set off some light bulbs in my brain was Charles Hughes uh, wrote an article that that's in an unseen light that's about Rufus Thomas. And he talks about Steve Cropper in that article and Steve Cropper getting a lot of the songwriting royalties when maybe he wasn't so involved in writing the songs. That's the implication that Rufus Thomas was making. Um, and, and uh, you know, so that's that's part of that dynamic. Um, but you can move further along with Stax because you know, you wrote the book about Stax. and made the movie too. <laughs> a book. A book. Um, well, the thing, one, one interesting thing I was thinking of about, uh, you know, about Stax and the, you know, the idea of whether uh, an individual place can influence a greater society and that kind of thing. I, I, one of the um, greatest stories I heard about Stax was from Floyd Newman, the saxophone player, who was one of the two or three original writers of Last Night. When the song comes out, there's five or I think five credits on there, two of whom, at least two of which didn't belong. Um, same kind of Steve Cropper thing you were mentioning. But uh, Floyd told me that it was Estelle's husband, Everett. Everett was known as, uh, it, Everett was a, uh, worked at the Kimberly Clark factory and um, was known to be uh, racist, I guess. Uh, he was, you know, he, he was very frightened by his wife's endeavor. Um, he was uncomfortable. He would come to Kimberly, he'd come from Kimberly Clark to hang out in the stacks lobby after work and uh, wait for her so that he could take her home. She work, would work late in the record store. So knowing his background, uh, his, his, his racist, uh, his discomfort with black people, I was really struck that he overheard a conversation where those extra writing credits we're going to be the writing credits and and Floyd and Gilbert Capel were going to be taken we're not going to get credit and it was Everett who goes over to them and says you guys got to go stand up now you know and and get your credits because you're going to lose this and and what i find interesting about that is that if you had told Everett Axton 5 years earlier that he was going to stand up for two black guys i don't think he would have believed he would have done it so i it's it's kind of and so what i find interesting is the way that the work inside of stacks affected individuals and that that could be a slow way to you know it's it's no way to change society you don't want to change a whole society one person at a time but it was in a, i was really struck when i was told that story about seeing that kind of change yeah, I mean, that's a, a really insightful and, and deep story. Um, I think since we're talking about stacks and we're getting 
to music now. I just would love to hear from, from everyone on the panel, like what do you think is the relationship between music and the civil rights movement? And also, you know, how much can music do to, to create change? Um, and in terms of the blues festivals, you know, is it the civil rights movement in a way that's creating the space that might bring people together or is it music that's doing that or is it both happening at the same time? So love some thoughts on that. Well, I think when you look at the role of music pertaining to civil rights, you know, song was one of the earliest signs of resistance. Uh, go, going back to the time of, of slavery practiced in America, you know, it was um, these relationships with spirituality and faith that surveyed and, and paved the way for people to use this inspiration as to continue to resist this unjust and senseless way of life. Um, and, and these same hymns and spirituals that we hear during the era of slavery before Appomattox, you know, it, it carries over into the cornerstone of organ organizations within the Black Freedom Struggle. And that's the, that's the Black church at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and then as you go closer into the civil rights movement, you know, and you have the gospel highway, the Chitlin circuit, and then these artists, some, some that, that were on stacks, they're, they're gospel faith singers and they become into secular music, you know, um, they break, they begin to break barriers. So that's obviously one of the big, the big points of emphasis there. And then looking at some of the songs and the meanings behind it and the reasons why they want, want them written. The greatest composition that I think that was written in the 20th century, maybe besides Billie Jean, was A Change Is Gonna Come, right? <laughs> and A Change Is Gonna Come is only written after he hears Dylan's Blowing In The Wind in 1962, right? And one of the greatest scenes, I think, is it's in a motion picture is, is when Denzel is playing Malcolm and he's on that ride to the Audubon on February 21st, 1965. And Sam says it after, right before he, the song is released. And, you know, he says, it feels like death. It feels like an eerie feeling each time that you hear it. Um, and so these songs kind of explain the mood, what's going on in 1964, end of 65. There's a civil rights bill. There's, there's a um, summer project, uh, college students that are disappeared, disappearing in Neshoba County. We're right here at the point where there's about to be 300 marchers attacked on what we know as Bloody Sunday, you know, and then these icons, these singers, these entertainers who we see on our television screen, they're beginning to even not just change their message in their songs, but they're changing their identity. They're changing the, the conch in their hair to this natural form. So this 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 culture that is stripped um, once they are you know kidnapped against their will on African soil and brought to the New World, they're embracing that same. And, and music in those soundtracks, those songs, those questions, they really really have a, a impact on the civil rights struggle. I, I would say too that the you know the the music is one thing, but the media is 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 another because it's people aren't seeing racial interaction when they're hearing music and um and and i think it's an interesting uh evolution of when record companies would put black faces on the album covers right you think about chuck berry's early albums they've got images, you know, not of him. And M the MGs are, I forget if they're on the back of, of the Green Onion album, but I know they're not on the front. Um, so, you know, that kind of, it, 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 I think it takes, I think in terms of the uh, of music having an uh, a, a aiding integration, I think it takes the visual presentation on television or uh, on, the, on the album art, you know, a way for people to see it to know it, to, to, to be more effective. One of the questions while you all were, were talking that it keeps knocking around in my, in, in my, um, in my brain 
is, and it's a scenario, right? You know, let's say for, for our purposes right now, there, there is somebody up on stage singing music forged in a very explicitly political moment, right? Singing some labor songs or some civil rights songs or some anti-war songs, right? The person up here on the stage is thinking really deep and critically about that issue, right? Let's say for our purposes, civil rights, right? You know, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's Sam Cooke talking, you know, saying a change is going to come. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 um, you know, um, pop staples and the staple singers, um, singing, I'll take you there, singing a spiritual, very explicitly related to this moment, this moment of movement, this moment of trying to, to get, to, to get greater freedom, as I like to call it. What's the relationship between the people on the stage and the people in the audience, right? Which I think is one of the, one of the sort of central questions that, we, that we're trying to knock around, that we ultimately are, are knocking around and that you're trying to sort of grapple with, right? You know, what's, what's the relationship between, right, blues musicians who are on the stage singing um, from a very specific and particular context? What's the relationship between them and the, you know, uh, and the interracial audience that will listen to these blues, to these blues musicians, right? So that's about positionality, right? That's about, um, and, and there's multiple answers to this question, right? You might be moved to go out and engage in some sort of activity that, you know, makes the lives of those blues singers better. You might be like, wow, that was really great. I love the music and go home and live your life and not, and, and, you know, and this moment was just this, I love the music, right? And you go on and, and live your life and then everything in between, right? So that's one of the questions that I think for me is, is really, um, that's one of the questions that I think a lot about, right? Is, is you know, what, 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 what's, the, what's the potential here? What are the possibilities? What are the parameters? And what are the, what are the ways in which we think of these, of these interactions? You know, and again, this is what you're grappling with in, in Robert, in your work, right? You've been grappling with this for way longer than I've been grappling with it, right? Just in terms of what, you know, what, what, what these possibilities can be. What, what do they look like, right? Um, and I, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's okay for us to understand the totality of that range, right? And not settle on one sort of, you know, one sort of answer, right? Um, there are people who are moved at the blues festival, but there are also people who didn't pay any money to be there, right? You know, when, when sister gets up and says, look, there's 3,000 people here, but we got money from 800 people. What the hell, right? You know, um, we are trying to pay, we're trying to give Fernie Lewis some money, right? We're trying to give these poor black people some, some funds, right? And, you know, 800 out of 3,000, that's not a really, that's, you know, that's less than 50%, right? So, so that's one of the questions that I think, you know, is, is continually sort of knocking around in, in, in my mind. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's one of the, the the biggest questions. And I think also the blues and blues revival are kind of particular cases different from Sam Cooke or, um, you know, Booker T and the MGs in, in some ways because they were older artists but also because I think there were a lot of exoticizing kind of fantasies projected onto blues men in certain cases. There was definitely. also a love and a lot. I Def don't want to, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know, I was just, I was just very much agreeing with that. Right. I mean, yeah, you know, that's one of the things that we see. Um, and, you know, and Robert has written about this extensively. Charles Hughes, my, my colleague who has also written about this. I mean, a whole bunch of people have written about this, right. You know, blues, blues, blues musician as relic. Right, blues musician as um, as a symbol of the past, right? Um, and as a symbol of the past, and you know, and Zandria Robinson and Jamie Hatley spoke really eloquently about this in your in your documentary, right? And uh, relics, symbols of the past that we don't have any, we don't have much need for anymore, right? And since we don't have much need for their, their symbols, we certainly don't have, we're certainly not going to take the opportunity to grapple with the meaning of the blues, right? To grapple with the context in which those blues are, are sung, are created, are crafted, right? So that's the other thing that we have to be careful about in this, in this moment 
because of that, because of the, the, the exotic, right, because of the exotic nature that we've assigned to blues men, right? You know, Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil and became really, really talented. No, Robert Johnson just practiced a lot, um, like other people did, and got really good at his instrument, right? You know, Satan was not involved in the what? production. Yeah, right. <laughs> Satan was not involved in the production of this blues musician, right? So, so yeah. So there's a lot of there's a lot of myth and there's a lot of exoticizing of of of, of blues musicians, which also, right, detracts from their expertise, right? Um, which also detracts from the fact that they're just really good musicians. Right, who who would shed it a lot, and you know, and have reached a level of technical um, mastery, right, which is infused by their personal experience, and so so that's the other thing that's certainly going on in this moment. Yeah, I mean, I think one figure um, of the musicians he played at the, the festival, who you know, always comes up when this is discussed, and but this is not actually a part of the film right now, is Nathan Beauregard, um, and they're when I interviewed people about Nathan Beauregard, um, you know, Bill Barth had said he was 103. Um, and we don't know why Bill Barth decided that, but, you know, it maybe was uh, a little bit of hucksterism or, you know, maybe a misunderstanding. I don't know. But when I interviewed people, people would say, yeah, he was 98. He was 102. He was 103. He was born a slave. Literally, someone said that, who I won't name. Um, and I think that can, and in fact, when you look at his draft cards and, and so forth that are more available now or harder to find at that point in the 60s, he was in his 70s, still immensely skilled as a musician. That's what's important about him. But a lot of what attracted people to him um, was this idea that he was this kind of mythical, magical figure. Well, and also that he, you know, these older people were exposed to things we are not exposed to. So they carry, you know, it's, they carry their knowledge and they perform it. So we get to, to see it. Uh, there was a shot in your film I want to ask you about, um, cause I thought it was, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was a highlight and it was an audience shot. And um, it was seemed like it was toward the back of the shell. It there was a group of white people on screen right and a group of, of black people on the left. And they leaned over and they were talking to each other. They sort of shared an exchange. So I'm curious, knowing the power of an edit and what we're not seeing, you know, it seemed what when you cut to that, the way I interpreted it as in the audience was you were showing us that these cultures that were that did not associate in other places were coming together at the shell and more than just sitting side by side they were interacting um is is that what was going on or could you tell i wasn't there but no, uh, I'm, I mean, like from <laughs> the, but, the rest yeah, of the film yeah. around that um i mean i think it's very interesting when you talk to people about it you'll get a lot of different answers about that I think there certainly was this opening up of possibility of conversation, um, you know, and and that is not a small thing, especially in 1966 when the festivals started um, and when the the staff restrooms at the Shell were still segregated, um, you know, that, that's just and they're just as uh, John Wilkins says in the film, you know. My dad, Robert Wilkins, was playing places, but he was playing for audiences of white people. And, you know, our people couldn't come and see him. So the shell being this open place that had not really welcomed black audiences at all before these events. Um, and still, I think there were more white people in the audience than African Americans, right? But there was this possibility of sitting next to people and talking to people and being someone like Henry Nelson who, who found his tribe there. Um, so I wanted to get that across, but I think the thing that's kind of amazing to me is that in the early stages of, or it was just a big reminder to me of what's going on in the world and what's been going on in the world. When In the early stages of making the film, I was talking to Ann Pitts, who was then the head of the Levitt Shell, and I said, these concerts are amazing because you can see these integrated audiences and I can't imagine how hard it was to get an integrated audience to come to the shell in 1966. And she said, it's pretty hard for me in 2016, even when I want to get an integrated audience at the shell, 
to be able to do it. So I think that that's a jumping off point to talk about, you know, where are we now and, and uh, you know, the impact of these events and how we can look at them now and with a little bit of maybe sense of hope, but also sense of a promise that maybe wasn't fulfilled. <laughs> Why don't y'all say something? <laughs> I think what I heard you say was, you know, how has what's happened in that period affected us today? Um, you know, I think that uh, we've come a long way from the era, era of segregation and Jim Crowism. Um, and, you know, I think one thing to take away from the civil rights movement to today that people should know about it today is that this was not that long ago. Um, that in many ways there are, it's still ongoing. You know, there wasn't an Instagram or a TikTok or a Twitter in 1965, you know, but there was a Jet Magazine. You know, there was a the Chicago Defender. There were people who were printing about these, the, this, this way of life beginning to take shape and form. Uh, second is that, you know, the people who really were the backbone of this movement were young people. You know, it was college students, 17, 18 years old, who are attending historically black colleges and universities, engaging in nonviolent direct action. Uh, you know, th they, they weren't ministers, they weren't clergymen. They were young college students who were inspired by some of these teachings and philosophies, but they were the ones who were signing their last will and testaments um, as, as 18, 19 years old. And so, you know, it, it, was a, it was a young 26-year-old Dr. King who was reluctantly taking on this task in Montgomery on the 5th of December, 1955. So, um, you know, and that there were one philosophy wasn't right or wrong, you know, nonviolent resistance captured and galvanized the movement that said a nonviolent mo movement creates a violent response to appeal to the hearts and minds of America on the issue of what does the 14th Amendment really mean and stand for. But when you have militants and you take um, a self-defense approach, when you have men like Du Bois, you have men like Garvey, you have men like Malcolm who come after them, men like Stokely, uh, who are wanting this 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 different, you know, a, a, approach to this. You know, it, it it builds a new sense of um, respect and dignity that was once not seen. And so I think those are the things that. Uh, have come from that era that people really should really uh, embrace today. And I, I think when you hear the shell say it's hard to get an integrated audience in 2016, um, you know, there's a, there's a, you can look at that from two ends. I think it's evidence of how difficult it is to make a, a big societal change. You know, people, uh, the zoo was closed to blacks except for Mondays. And that's what, and you know, and that's part of the Overton Park complex. And so there's been, you know, people have historical associations that become, you know, cultural associations with institutions. And um, I'm, I'm, I can, I can, I'm happy to say that I've been involved in some projects with the Shell to do outreach to communities unaware of the shell or of its open invitation so that hopefully in in the present year you know post covid these things will be enacted and 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 that that more kind of direct going into other communities taking the shell into other communities shell on wheels will you know make those kind of changes and i think there's other you know that's looking at it from the back end and looking at it from the front end it's like well you know Maybe the shell wasn't booking the right shows to bring. Maybe they were booking shows that geared only toward young white people, and and that would be a you know that would be part of the problem. One of the questions that I, I keep knocking around is just you know, um, the whole question of integration, right? And you know, and and 
and what do we think, what exactly do we think integration is supposed to do, right? Um, Furry Lewis performs in front of an integrated audience. Okay, so what, right? You know, um, did, you know, I, and so, you know, I'm, I got bigger questions as to whether or not this, you know, this, and, and this could be a profound moment, right? For, for both the audience as well as for Mr. Lewis in, 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 terms, of, in terms of that moment. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, does, does Furry Lewis die after, you know, um, does he spend the last 20 years of his life getting the royalty checks from the, from the record companies that he, that he recorded with, right? I mean, you know, um, there's a moment in your film where, uh, you know, where all of these local blues cats are like, yeah, you know, we used to go to Furry and he would give us all of these lessons. And I'm thinking, did you pay him? Right. You know, um, or if any of these cats are still musicians now. Right. I mean, how many dozens of people are you giving free lessons to? Right. Um, so I think about the. So I think about. So I don't necessarily think about integration. I think about the trajectory in terms of how we think about um, black people performing and that performing as labor. Right. Um, black folks have always performed in front of white people. That's not new at all in 1960. The context is different, right? You go out and you, you know, if you, if you own somebody who's really good on the violin on Saturday nights, you have the person you own come out and play violin for the people in your you know, little swamp, your, your, you know, your plantation or your farm or whatever, right? That's free labor. Thank you, Jonah, for your performance. Violin is such lovely music now. And, and, and that's performance in a very particular context. You move up 100 years to the 1920s, what's changed, right? Slavery has gone away, but what's the relationship between black folk and, and performance and labor, right? And are they getting paid for their labor? And how has, the, how has the audience changed? Move it up another 40 years, ask the same question, right? In terms of what, what are the sort of material, what are the material transformations that are taking place? Or are, or are the material transformations taking place, right? People who are performing, are they making, are they, are, they, are, are they earning the money that is due to them? The Rolling Stones did not come to Memphis because um, somebody, because the city was like, we're not paying you scale, which was 50 bucks, right? I think it was 50 bucks a pop. How many people in the Rolling Stones? Uh, five? Yeah. So that's, that's $250, right? So the, so the city of Memphis was like, we're not paying $250. And the Rolling Stones did not say, well, we will come and play for free. The Rolling Stones said, even with this paltry amount of money, if you are not paying us, we are not performing. You don't get our free labor, right? And nobody bats an eye at the Rolling Stones saying, no, because I'm not working for free, right? But Furry Lewis is supposed to give lessons to people who roll up on his doorstep for the last 20 years of his life for free as far as i can tell i don't know right so so this is the thing right so the question is for me the question is what is what exactly is when we center integration right as sort of the as sort of the object of the game here what exactly does that mean right what exactly are we thinking is going to happen when we create these sorts of spaces right and history shows us that we can create these spaces Right? But if we don't change the material conditions and the context in which those spaces are created, then we haven't really done anything or we've done a lot less than we thought we have. The most integrated concert I have ever been to was a Prince concert. And it was glorious because I don't know if you all know this, that brother could play, right? It was in Durham, right before I moved to, to Memphis. And I looked around towards the end of the concert and you know there are people there who are teenagers and there are people there in their 60s, right? You know, almost everybody's wearing purple. Um, and, uh, you know, for those of you who grew up in the church, right? Jesus loved little yellow, red, and black and white, right? I mean, you know, you would look around, yellow, red, and black and white. This is the most multiracial moment, musical moment of my life, bar none. It was brilliant. Age, race, you know, a bunch of same sex, you know, a bunch of same sex couples, you know, just because he has opened up, because the, the great purple one opened up this type of space, 
where all of these folks knew that they could come and be affirmed in who, in who they are. That's a powerful statement. That's a powerful moment. That's a Saturday night. What's up on Monday? Right? What happens in the wake of that powerful, in that powerful moment? If that moment is transforming people, what are the ways in which that moment is transforming people? Right? Um, should we should we feel a sense of, should Prince feel a sense of obligation in terms of that type of, in terms of whatever sorts of transformations that are taking place, right? Are the blues musicians and the people putting, putting this thing together, what's their, what, you know, what responsibilities are they feeling? They've got objectives, right? And we can evaluate those objectives. They're ambitious, they're a little naive, but their hearts are in the right place, most definitely, right? So again, we can, we can, we can look back, and again, hindsight's twenty twenty. So we can look back on those moments in the late 60s and early 70s and see what and see what's viable, right? In terms of how people are how people are thinking through and thinking about that, thinking through and thinking about that moment. Memphis is going to continue to become even more racially stratified in the late 60s and early 70s, right? That's that that trajectory is not going to stop. Right. And again, I'm not saying that, you know, that the blues festival, that's the blues festival's fault, right? You know, the blues festival. The object of the game for them was not to end racism, right? It was not to end segregation. That's not the that's not the old, that's not the object of the game here, right? But again, it's really it's it's this gives us an opportunity to look back and see what it is that we are actually valuing. What are what are the priorities here? What are the things that we're trying to we're hoping to achieve and accomplish by creating interracial spaces? What exactly does proximity do for us? It can do some things, right? But it can't do other things. And I think that's what we have to be really, really clear about. What proximity can do for us and what, what proximity cannot do for us. Well, it's also, as Xandria Robinson says in the film, it's like, what is the nature of the proximity, the nature of the collaboration? There was, you know, really the focus of the people who were involved in organizing those concerts was making money, even if it wasn't a huge amount of money, didn't buy anybody a house, but it was still five times what Fred McDowell made during a year of sharecropping in one night. So I, I do think that that was the big focus and that was something that was really important to them. And that should definitely be, and that should definitely be applauded. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's, that's one of the things that really stands out in your film. They're like, look, we're trying to put money in these folks' pockets. Right. And that's really and that's that's really important because it did not have to be that way. Right. For every one of the Memphis for, for, for a festival like Memphis to, to, to take that position, that's not a position that a whole bunch of people are necessarily taking in the late 60s, and early 70s. Not a position a whole bunch of people are taking right now. <laughs> right. Quite frankly. Right. So, again, they should be applauded. They should be applauded for that effort. Most definitely. And at the same time, shining a light on this indigenous talent, you know, this local talent that. Um, has not been, you know, has been ignored. So I thought, uh, because there is the possibility that it could lead to more gigs, you know, people become aware Furry Lewis is in town, Furry Lewis lives here, they might be able to. So I, I think that was another, you know, another great focus, uh, uh, another great result of the festival. And it also makes me think of the, a story that has been going in my head, I forget what else, someone said that, sparked it and uh it's not a local story um there was a i think it's in north carolina there was a black piano player someone in the audience comes up to him and says oh you play just like jerry lee lewis and the guy explains well jerry lee he said no 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 jerry lee plays just like the people in haney's big house where i where you know where this guy had an association or something and the white man who was complimenting him refused to believe that jerry lee lewis wasn't suey generous that there had been that 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 Jerry Lee had learned from somebody and this guy eventually uh schools him and um and the guy confesses that he's in the clan and this piano player winds up with the guy's clan robe and now has a collection of like I don't know some hundreds of robes individuals he has converted you know or he, in, minds he has individually opened um, so I think of that as like, you know, kind of a dream scenario of 
one person being able to affect many people through their talent and their skills at explaining history. And the possibility, and that possibility was there in these blues festivals. Yeah, I think so too. At the same time, of course, you know, once something becomes value, the city of Memphis wants it. <laughs> somebody wants to put it on a t-shirt. Somebody wants to make money out of, out of it. Um, and, and often a lot of the people making that money were, were not black Americans or, or, or black Memphians, they were white Memphians. So, you know, that's, that's still something that I think is going on. I mean, in this discussion of appropriation that happens in the film, um, from from Zandria Robinson, who used to teach here at Rhodes, and and Jamie Hatley, um, I think is very important for that for that reason. But I mean, going back to what you're saying, Robert, that it does actually matter to identify the people who, you know, formed the basis, the foundation of our culture, our music. And, you know, there are a lot of them who are Memphians, right? And, and African-American Memphians. So it is important to say that, but at the same time, going back to Charles, how much does that matter if they don't get paid? So we, we have to have both, I think. And, uh, and there's still a lot of work to be done for sure. And I would say, you know, I, I, um, there was a lot of emphasis in my last comment on getting paid. And let's be clear, where's the camera? it is important to get paid, <laughs> right? So uh, important to get paid, right? Um, that is very, that's very important. The other, the other exchange here though, right, is in addition to, right, a, 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 a racial and then therefore economic context in which we have every expectation that black people are going to labor for free, the other thing that we have to be very mindful of and, and really careful about, and I think you, you, you talk about this a little bit in the, in the film as well, is, is the erasure that can take place in terms of decontextualizing the blues. I think it was that, that awesome Steve Allen clip, right? Was that Steve Allen who was like- That was know, Steve Allen, Yeah, yes. he's like, you know, I think everybody can, you know, I don't think just black people can play the blues. I think, you know, if you have ever experienced melancholia, <laughs> then you can and I was I, I rewound that like 12 times I was like <laughs> I was like Steve Allen just said if you have experienced melancholia then you can <laughs> right you know oh I, you know my report's gonna be late at work this week right you know my concur reports didn't you know submit in my Instagram is down right <laughs> so therefore I can sing the blues right what seriously <laughs> Um, although a whole bunch of people were singing the blues because Facebook was down for like a day or whatever, right? So, you know, so the, so the idea that, you know, just a little, you know, just a little dabble, just a little smidgen of melancholia, right, you know, qualifies you to be a blues singer, again, gets back to this, gets back to what can be lost in these moments when we, you know, to, to, to really emphasize Zandria's point, when we don't take um, the cultural context seriously as to why people are singing the blues to begin with, right? Um, and that's the other thing, that's the other thing when we want to recognize the music, the musicians know and understand that, right? You know, when Furry Lewis sings about loss, Furry is singing in a way about loss that I could never sing about, and I'm fully black, right? Furry is singing, Furry is bringing something on a whole different, different level, right? His life in Mississippi was a life that was tinged with, 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 with contingency. There was nothing certain in that life, right? When you're growing up black in Mississippi in the 19 whatevers, right? In a, in a deeply and rigidly segregated society, there is no certainty in your life, except uncertainty, except chaos, right? And the possibility of violence. Now, the other certainties that you have are your family and your networks and your friends and your homies, right? You know, the, the, the certainties of, you know, the certainties of your circle, that you that you that you you know that you lay claim to your church if you're a church member right your family your friends again um, the certainty of work the certainty of 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 degradation the certainty of of sweat and labor and of being unpaid so there there are some uncertain so there's a lot of stuff to to, to grapple onto right so when furry is singing and when all these other brothers and sisters right who are, who are singing their experiences 
that ain't Instagram going down, right? That's not, um, you know, there's an extra shot of, you know, there's an extra shot of espresso. I asked for three and I got four. I'm going to sing the blues now. This is a whole different experience. And when we try to separate the music out from the experience, then that's the other hit that we take when it comes to how this music can be transformative. Again, Zandri and Jamie are also talking about this. It can't be transformative if we don't take the context and the origins of the music seriously. Right? It can't be transformative. It can't transform if I don't understand what it is or if I'm not making any serious effort to understand what it is. You know, if you think it sounds good, that's your business. That's fine. Right. But if you don't have a sense of of why it sounds the way it sounds, if you don't have a sense of, again, the origins and context, then you are going to be less able to grapple with the reasons why a person like Furry Lewis is singing the way he's singing. Right. And so that's the other thing that, you know, that's the other thing that we always have to be mindful of in terms of the commercialization, in terms of, you know, all of the other stuff that we see, you know, happening and occurring in and around the, you know, in and around the blues and other types of music, right. And other types of, of you know, black culture, quite frankly. Right. So, so that's the other thing I think that, you know, we can be, we can be mindful of as we look back on that era. Absolutely. And really important. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I, I did try to go into archives and get as much kind of oral history directly from the players, just talking about their lives and their experience and learning to play on the banjo or starting having your first gig like white at seven years old, um, you know, but also incredible hard lives of people like Furry Lewis, especially. Um, I think that that's, that's really really important to bring that forward into the present and hopefully into the future for people to hear. Um, and so I guess I want to kind of close out with maybe everyone on the panel thinking about from this moment, whether that's the Memphis Country Blues Festivals or whether that's the moment of the 60s. Brian has already talked a little bit about this. I'm going to talk more. Um, what is it important that we do bring forward? Um, what can inspire us and, and what is it important to preserve? That, and also you can say, what should we throw away? That's all right too. Yeah, well, I mean, it, we can't cheat history. Uh, and I think that if the, the sooner that we acknowledge and accept the truth and, uh, of what all that entails, um, whether that's the story of discrimination, the story of, of racism, the story of poverty, the story of economic injustice, uh, the sooner that we can re we can reconciliate uh, to move to move forward. Um, and you know, with new theories that are passed concerning how do we teach that in our curriculums now at all levels of education. You know, I think we take we're taking a step back. You know, I think we're 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 at a point. Um, I'll make an MLK reference here. You know, I I would see that we are at a point where MLK was at uh, 1967. You know, he's past the glory days of I have a dream and I just won the Nobel Prize and I I have successfully integrated the most segregated city in America. But now that dream that I had of this, what I saw is now becoming a nightmare. And I think that that is where we are, we as a society are going and going to by trying to limit uh, how we teach history in, in, in that way. I would uh, like to echo something that Charles said earlier about question the bar. I think it's also important when we're reading history to question the narrator, you know, look at who is telling the story and what is their history and what is their, what, you know, what are they trying to do? Because, because I think we have all had a very serious lesson in the malleability of facts and that it's important and that, you know, we all have known you can't trust what you read that you have to question it. And I think that's just become all the more important 
Um, I'm not sure I can tie that to the Blues Festival, but I tie it to our conversation. Um, yeah. <laughs> what they what they said, and um, you know, culture is uh, a complex and complicated entity, and I know I don't have to tell you that. Um, I certainly don't have to tell the folks on the on the on the stage that. Probably don't have to tell y'all that either. Culture is a really complicated thing. Um, and when we are thinking through and thinking about right performative elements and aspects of culture, there's lots of questions on the table in terms of what we what we hope and want that that performance to do. What do we want art to do for us? Right? W. B. Du Bois said, you know, art should be you know, art should be explicitly political. Art that doesn't move, you know, he's talking in the 1920s, he's like, art that doesn't move, advance the freedom of black people should not be made, right? Um, Langston Hughes says, no, 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 back it up a little bit. That's not quite what we need to be doing. Zora Neale Hurston says, no, 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 that's not what I'm trying to do. If my art does that, great. If it does not, that's fine too, right? Um, so we have to be really careful about what we want, what we think we want art to do. And so since we have to think expansively about the purpose of art and about the role art plays in social change, we also have to be really expansive in terms of how that, heart, that art hits people, right? People's experience of art, people's experience of the blues or of, of hip hop or opera or anything else for that matter. We have to think really expansively about about those multiple responses when we think through and think about this moment. So um, thank you for this opportunity to think about the blues and to think about Memphis and to think about um, the possibility of the possibility and the potential for change. Um, always unrealized, um, you know, always in the pursuit of a more perfect union. You never get there. You're never perfect. Um, but it's good. To, but it's good to think through and think about these moments of possibility. And so thank you for that opportunity. I really appreciate it. And it was a great film. Thank you very much. Well, I hope all of you here and everyone who watches the, the live stream will join me in thanking these amazing panelists, um, Dr. Charles McKinney, Mr. Ryan Jones, and Robert Gordon. Thank you so much for sharing these thoughts um, and getting us all to think about that, that possibility and hoping that that moral arc of the universe and the artistic arc of the universe, sometimes it keeps bending towards justice. I hope so. Um, thank you. And if you don't know yet, you better go try and see. Um, there's a great concert at uh, the Levitt Shell again tonight by Blind Mississippi Morris. Um, and uh, it's free to all. So I hope you can come enjoy it. And uh, maybe I'll see some of you there. And thank you mu so much for this conversation again.